Hello everyone, welcome back. So, I am doing the horrors of the, they, it's pronounced Walliska with like a W, but people say Walliska. I've heard both. Uh, this is the horrors of the Walliska Axe Murder House. This is in Iowa happened June 10th 1912 or June 11th maybe June 12th somewhere around there um, I read a book about it it's great but this is BuzzFeed the two guys on BuzzFeed I can't think of their names um, Mo and Curly I don't know and so we're going to break this down into two videos but they are going to go there if you've never heard the story i'm not going to spoil it for you but uh it's it's not pleasant okay i'll spoil it for you you know so husband and wife their four kids and two friends came back from church one night and went to bed I don't know if it was six kids or not anyways might have been six kids eight people total or it was six people total we'll find out they come back they go to bed the next morning the neighbors notice they're not out feeding chickens doing the I don't know walking the cows whatever you do with cows and so they call the police the police come and investigate and they find every excuse me they find every single person in the house has been killed you want to guess how so they don't know if the person broke in when they were gone, had been in there for a while. They're not sure, but they used their family axe, which was common. You split wood with it back in those days uh, for like firewood, stuff like that. Used their axe, which was not sharp. So he used the back part of the axe. Went room to room, bashing them over the head. Then went back and went to town on their faces just I mean obliterated their skulls and was raising it and bringing it down leaving axe mark cuts in the ceiling so this is what you're going to be getting into if you want to watch this video um, but this is BuzzFeed so they're probably going to make it a little humorous at times but it is still a very disturbing story so we'll break this down into two parts we'll do two 17 minute parts and we'll go from there Oh, by the way, the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to go to this house. Probably not this year, but it may be next year. But it might be one of those. You can do an overnight trip where you can stay in the house in one of the rooms. The room with the crawl space where they think the person might have been broken. Uh, a lot of paranormal activity, supposedly. But you can also just tour the home itself. Well, we've been wanting to come here a long time. Yeah, bit of a bucket list place, huh? Yeah. It's just when I actually cross the items off this bucket list, I'm not very excited. I am when I'm at home imagining it, but now that I'm standing here looking at it. Now you gotta be brave. Yeah. Do you remember how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> the Bliska Axe Murder House. Look, it's kind enough to remind us when the horrible oh, event happened. Yeah. Grab a it was June 10th, 1912. Picture, send a postcard to your parents. Ugh. This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we investigate the Velisca Axe Murder House as part of our ongoing investigation into the question, are ghosts real? Oh, it's back. 
a location voted one of the most terrifying places in America, this unassuming family home in Villisca, Iowa, was the setting for one of the most grisly, infamous unsolved murders in American history. So the ghoul boy is going to show up and do that little dance. Right Knowing here. absolutely nothing about this and having driven through Iowa, I'm terrified. Because I don't believe in ghosts, but I do believe that Iowa is haunted. Just as a whole, just as soon as you cross the state lines, you could have a hitchhiking ghost. Yeah, and look, I'm sure there's plenty of nice people in Iowa, but I'm from <laughs> Illinois, so they can all go oh fuck them. Oh, God, let's <laughs> not bring up beef. Yeah, we got beef. There's no reason to bring up the I-State turf war. There's a lot of turf out there in the Midwest. Turf wars, yeah, we don't like each other. How many skulls have you claimed in this turf war? <laughs> Countless. Oh, shit. Okay. I do know that I, I don't think I have any beef with Iowa, but it seems like Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Missouri, Indiana, Iowa. I don't know what it is, but it just feels like there's competition there. Sports teams, just, you know, Illinois has better people, whatever the choice, you know, you want to say. Detroit Lions are awesome. Whatever. Let's get into it. Built in 1868, this three-bedroom house was purchased by local business owner Josiah B. Moore in 1903. Josiah, his wife, Sarah, and their four children, Herman, Catherine, Boyd, and Paul, lived in the small frame home located on 2nd Street and were the very picture of a perfect family. On June 9th, 1912, Around 9.30 p.m., the Moore family made their way back home after attending a special service for children at the local church. The Moore family was joined by Lena and Ina Stillinger, who were friends of their eldest daughter and were sleeping over that night. Early the next morning, Mary Peckham, the Moore's neighbor, was up at 5 a.m. hanging laundry. By 7 a.m., she noticed that no one in the Moore home was awake and doing their usual daily chores. Mary recalled that something just felt off. The Moore's untended horses began neighing, so Mary walked over to the Moore home and knocked on their door. There was no answer. She attempted to open the door, but found it to be locked. Growing increasingly distressed, Mary called Josiah's brother Ross, and at 8.30 a.m. on the morning of June 10th, 1912, Ross Moore stepped inside his brother's family home to find the unthinkable. I just want to point out, back in those days, when you made a call, you dialed the operator, for people who don't know. You dialed the operator, and you said, yes, operator, connect me to the Moore home. Okay, little switches, little plugs, boom, 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 whatever, however you do it. And then you would you would make that call. Now I'm telling you this for a reason because there's one part that I don't know if they'll talk about, but I will bring it up. But um, kind of keep that, and you know, we'll put a pin in it and we'll come back to it. This might be the door that the uh, killer entered through, or at least some suspect that. And here we are. Hello! Hi there! Well, this is the kitchen, and as you can see, everything is pretty much set as it would have been in 1912. All of the furniture is almost the same. This, for the most part, is what it looked like that night. Every footstep in here shakes this ass. You know, just as a quick example, because it seems to really, if I just give a little. Which makes it kind of hard for me to believe that this guy could have snuck around, but he did, somehow. Do you get bad vibes from this place, Ryan? I mean, I don't love it. I don't love any of the places that we go through, but I will say that this place in particular, because it's so small and such horrible things happen in such a small area, the concentrated dread here is unlike most places we've been to. <laughs> Ross opened the door to the downstairs bedroom to find the lifeless and bloodied bodies of Lena and Ina Stillinger in bed. The local paper paints a gruesome picture of what Ross Moore beheld that fateful morning. Quote, their heads chopped open with an axe, 
a spectacle so repulsive that it was almost beyond comprehension that six more victims, murdered in identically the same fashion, lay in the two bedrooms upstairs." End quote. In just one night, eight people had been systematically murdered with an ax, and not one person heard or saw a thing. Upon investigation, all eight victims appear to have been killed in their sleep, with one exception. The only sign of struggle apparent was with Lena Stillinger. Her arm was arranged in a way that appeared she had tried to stop the attacker. She also had a small cut on that same arm to suggest that she may have been nicked by the axe. Strangely, investigators also discovered a two pound slab of raw bacon, carefully wrapped in a dish towel in the same room in which the Stillinger girls were found. Obviously the fact that someone could commit heinous crimes like this is baffling to me, but the bacon just kind of tips it over the edge for me. I just don't understand it. My thoughts are, it is someone who knows the family and they have some weird personal gripe that has to do with like a haul. Oh, so this is kind of like the equivalent of like the horse head in the bed. Exactly. Or he missed breakfast. This is the room that the Stillinger girls. Um, how do I phrase this? How should I say this? They uh, think that the bacon was used as a... So the, some of the bodies had been posed and they think that the bacon was used in a way of uh, self-gratification. Can, can you show them, like, um, yeah, as, thank you, Kate. Very weird and inappropriate of you to have done that, but we get the gesture that she's, back to the video. We're killed in, and this is actually the first two bodies that were found by uh, Mr. Moore's brother. Well, they've sure got this place stocked up with spooky toys. That is true, they definitely cornered the market on creepy dolls. Well, it's said that people feel very oppressive feelings in here. It's said to have split groups up. They'll start arguing with each other and stuff like that. I dare them to try and split us up. Can't be done. Can't be done. We're ghoul brothers. That's a bond that lasts forever. They also found the two pounds of bacon right there. Mm, yum. I'm going to turn on a device here that may help you speak with us. You could use the energy from this device to communicate. It's everyone's favorite tool. Say it with me. Here Spirit. comes the Spirit, the Spirit Box. Box. Okay, my name is Brian. I'm Shane. Can you say our names back to us? If there's something here with us right now, can you say Ryan or Shane? Right now I'm reaching out to whoever murdered in this house. Why did you do it? Hey! What did he say? I'm gonna ask you again. Prove to me that it was you who did this, because I don't believe you. Hey, you sick little weirdo. <laughs> huh? I'm reaching out to Lena and Ina right now. I'm really sorry what happened to you happened to you. Can you tell me your names if you're here? Do we, are you scared of us? Who do you just said switch. Switch? Oh, I'll hold it. You want to talk to me? Here. Oh, I've never held this thing before. I don't enjoy it. <laughs> talk to me. I don't respect you. That should rile you up. I think you suck. Ryan loves you. Big fan of your work. That's not true. <laughs> yeah, he's a sicko just like you. That's not true. I think you're a loser. Jesus. That thing sucks. Almost 100 years <laughs> he's, he's a big fan of your work. Okay. You comfortable? You keep falling on me. You know, you freak out a lot of people. <laughs> That's why you're here. Yeah, you just go ahead. And... I like it better when you stare at the camera. 
2009. One visitor visited the newly renovated home now owned by Darwin and Martha Lynn and attempted to make contact with the Stillinger girls in the very room in which their lives were shockingly cut short. The visitor called out to the girls, asking them to turn his flashlight off and on. They obliged every time, causing him to proclaim, quote, I believe the spirits of all eight victims still dwell within that house, end quote. The mag light is hooey. Why? Because it's not, there's, <sighs> oh God, I think he blacked out. There's no correlation. Even if the flashlight was turning on and off, you okay, hear- okay, okay, calm down, calm down. <laughs> you, there's nothing to back it up. There's no science behind it. You could say nothing at all. They will turn on and off. Here's the best I can use here. Okay. We're sleeping in a tent. We hear hoof noises outside. We wake up in the morning and see hoof prints outside. And I say, there were horses here last night. And you say, yes, it was a unicorn. And I say, what? Well, That's what's happening well, here. unicorns aren't real. And ghosts are real. Ah! <laughs> now for me to really think there's something here, I'm gonna need to see some intelligent responses on the actual I just want to say I, I don't own a flashlight that will turn on or turn off on its own. The only way it turns off is if the batteries die. I've never had one just magically turn on, and I've never voice commanded one to turn off. That's just me. Flashlight, I tell you to turn on. We're not just focusing on one flashlight. We're looking for Morse code. If there's something in here right now, please turn off the black one while turning on the blue one. So we want to see them switch. Exactly. Oh. oh no, not good enough. You got to turn the black one off if you remember the instructions. <laughs> That's what we were asking for. Let's turn off that black flashlight. Huh? That's good. I like Come that. on. You really commanded. We'll just turn off that sexy little black flashlight. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> Boy, you're not good at following instructions, huh? Oh, 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 oh switching them now? Oh, Are you gonna oh, switch it? Oh, switch from the black to the blue right now. Oh, 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 oh. no. No, oh, you're teasing us tonight, <laughs> huh? Come on. Look, we've heard lots of reports that whatever is in here loves playing with these flashlights. And all I'm seeing right now is random activity. Okay, now we're at even. Okay, baseline. Turn the blue one, the one on the left, in five, four, three, two, one. Blue one on now. Turn on the blue one in three, two. Mm. Fuck. It's too soon. If we do it enough times, it'll be perfect. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not gonna think that's a real thing. I don't know, man. I think we're alone in this room right now. Yeah, I'm saying this house has good vibes. Seriously. Maybe you bring in the good vibes. Maybe you're I do just... bring good vibes. They're probably very happy that uh, not some dour ghost hunter coming in here being like, oh, I feel sense of energy. <laughs> you know, I'm coming in being like, let's party, folks. Except for the murderer. We do not want to party with you. It may sound unimaginable now, but due to the heinous nature of these crimes and the fact that the town of Villisca only had 2,000 residents, the crime scene became a full-blown spectacle yes. with upwards of 100 people touring the home. With the body... Yeah, the bodies of the victims were laying there. The guy, go, the brother goes out, he gets the cops. The people just start walking through the house like hey let's go check out the dead bodies people took pictures they took things off the wall some people took skull fragments I mean what what of the eight victims still in it. Yeah. Even after arriving to examine the scene, the town marshal went so far as to let the townspeople handle the ax, utterly contaminating the murder weapon left behind by the killer themselves. Do you think this has anything to do with why this case is unsolved? 
I think it has everything to do with it, Ryan. Well, step right up. Come <laughs> here and see if you can do the same whack. Like, <laughs> you got me? Uh, oh, oh, hey, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> wait a second. I was smiling in that one. Do uh, another one. Yeah. <laughs> That's the the town marshal. Again. Iowa. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Finally, at noon, about three and a half hours after the bodies were found, the Villisca National Guard arrived. When they were finally able to secure the scene, authorities could then begin investigations into who could have committed these eight gruesome axe murders on a quiet Sunday night in a town the Iowa Touring Atlas called, quote, one of the finest cities in the state, end quote. The motive for the murders was unclear, as there was no evidence of a robbery or any other reason why the Moore family would have been targeted. Investigators found Josiah's pants hung on his and Sarah's bedpost, still containing cash, a check, and keys. They also found a huge gash in the wall of the parents' upstairs bedroom right above the mirror, now covered with clothing by the murderer. It is believed this mark was made, quote, by the upswing of the axe, end quote. Further evidence bears this out as Josiah was the only victim killed with the sharp end of the ax. All seven others died by being bludgeoned with the blunt back edge of the ax. This is the bedroom of Josiah and Sarah Moore, and it was here that there still is a mark from the ax from the upswing, so you could only imagine the force that this dude was coming down on. There is a dread to this room. Also, once again, sheet over the mirror. Just straight up spooky. There's something about this guy. There's like, I don't know if it's a vanity thing or he, he was ashamed of what he was doing, but he couldn't control himself. And it's in, it was in the girl's bedroom. It's been everywhere. Yeah. So I don't know what his deal is. Right now I'm reaching out to the spirit of Josiah and Sarah Moore. First off, thank you for having us in your house. Really genuinely sorry for what happened to you. If there's anything you'd like to let us know about that night, Please, reach out to us. We're very non-judgmental. What? Sorry. Can you say that again? While the voice I heard in this moment was not captured, an audio recorder left in this room later picked up a voice saying this. What is it? What is it? What is it? Is this the voice of the Velisca Axe murderer? Who's here with me right now? Why did you do what you did? Strangely, all eight of the victims' faces had been covered with clothing or bedding after being killed, and at some point, the murderer is also believed to have closed all the window curtains. So obviously you couldn't covered up those mirrors before he killed he them. He could have be too if, loud. if he was like sneaky. Well, he's gotta be sneaky in the first place. Was it rainy that night or anything? How loud is it in Iowa? Because to kill one person and not wake up another person, impressive. To kill seven people That's true. and not even wake up the eighth one, how? Among cigarette butts. They think that one of the kids woke up and tried to run. They're, they haven't talked about the two friends, so I'm gonna go ahead and bring it up now. Uh, hold on, just give me a second. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and bring it up now. So, the two friends went over to the house and uh, stayed the night. Sadly, they were killed. They were, you know, part of the murder when I told you that the lady called the well that they said called the brother brother showed up he goes into town people st start showing up well the reason goes back to that phone call that I said where somebody you call the operator and she connects you well the operator picks up a phone call from someone trying to get a hold of like the sheriff or, or you know cop there's a death at the uh, there's been there's been uh, a murder murders at the uh, the more the more family home everybody's dead 
connect me to this. Okay, boom. The operator isn't under some hush-hush thing. So people start calling, hey, operator, connect me to this. She may know that lady on the line. The operator might know that lady. Well, what do you think starts happening? Oh my gosh, you won't believe this, but uh, the neighbor to the Moore family, you know, Debbie, she called up and, and uh, she's getting a hold of the guy because no one's answering. And then the sheriff called and said that the whole family was killed. And, you know, the people were like, what? Yeah, I'll connect you to your call. Boom, connects her. Well, then that woman tells the person she was talking to. That person gets off the phone contacts the operator to call someone else. Meanwhile, the operator's connecting phone calls and just telling people, okay? Well, one of those phone calls placed to the operator was an attempt to connect to the Moore family. Who was it? That was the mother of the two daughters. The operator, I'm sorry. She says to the operator, connect me to the Moore family. The operator's response why do you need to call that house? Everyone there's dead. Click. That was how that lady found out her children had been murdered. Just think about that. That's how you find out your kids are are dead. It not because the cops show up, not because of the not not the what you would think is the proper procedure. You're found out because a operator, not not realizing that's your children that are now part of that victims group, you talk to the one person who has no tact and just, yeah, and then just disconnects on you because, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing you a favor. Yeah, why are you going to call them? They're all dead. <laughs> Stupid person. Click, hangs up on them. I can't imagine what goes through her head because she had to have tried to dial again to the operator like what connect me to the Morehouse what are you talking about until finally you go to the Morehouse yourself because you you want to find and then you see all the people outside people walking out with skull fragments hey look what I got tossing it in the air like it's a coin what a terrible thing now that was just that was a hundred and 111 years ago we are vastly different well are we in bloody footprints investigators also found food on the kitchen table from where the murderer had fixed themselves something to eat before exiting out the front door locking it and taking the key with them years it's nice that he locked it you know he doesn't want any anyone to get hurt or stolen. Later, the home's caretaker, Johnny Hauser, would have another encounter originating in the kitchen that would stop him in his tracks. Hauser, who has stated that he was very much a skeptic prior to working at the house, said, quote, I'm up in the kids' room, and I lock the kitchen door so nobody can walk in. And as I'm up there, somebody walks in the house, end quote. Hauser goes on to say he's so positive it's someone trespassing that he decides to pull a prank that will set them straight. So he hides in the closet of the children's upstairs bedroom and waits until, quote, finally he goes upstairs into the room I'm in. I kick the door open and scream. Nothing. At all. Soon as I see there's nothing, it just sucked the air like I got the wind knocked out of me. End quote. This is the children's room, obviously. This is where all the more children slept. I don't know if I want to jump into this one yet. We're going to go ahead and end it there. It's a little... Oh, my nose itches. Okay, it's a little short of the time that I wanted, but I think I added a little bit, so I... But, you know, the last one's going to be 18 minutes. Sorry. Okay, so we're going to end this here. This is part one of the horrors of the Williska or Villisca Axe Murder House. Okay, like and subscribe.
and uh, come back for part two, which will be tomorrow. And until then, you have a good day. Have a good night.